Welcome to Conversations in Integrative Medicine sponsored by Natural Clinician and the Holt Institute of Medicine. I'm going to talk today about essential fatty acids but I'm not going to go into much biochemical detail because my conversations in integrative medicine are designed not only for healthcare practitioners but also for professional staff in the office um, and ancillary staff. So, you know, I'm talking about therapeutics and I'm talking about nutritionals and obviously this has some implications for how dietary supplements can and cannot be used. So I'm talking about third party conversation here. Uh, I'm not talking about products or product labeling. But let's look at essential fatty acids and bring to mind what are the three. Well, there's omega-3, there's omega-6, omega-9. Let me dispense with 6 and tell you that there is an overabundance of omega-6 essential fatty acids in the diet. Western diets are loaded with vegetable sources of omega-6. And this overloading of 6 has provided us with a circumstance of relative deficiency of omega-3. And omega-3 fatty acids are perceived as very health-giving. 6s tend to be, for want of... Uh, simplistic language more involved in, in, in promoting prostaglandin pathways or eicosanoids towards uh, less healthy types of activity than do omega-3 fatty acids. That's a broad generalization because obviously omega-6 fatty acids and their precursors have specific very important biological effects that are vital for a healthy body function. But, you know, out there is really a widespread deficiency of omega-3 fatty acids. And we have in industrialized societies a ratio of intake of 6, omega-6, to 3, of something of the order of anything from 10 to 20 to 1. Whereas, if, if you listen to scientists and, in fact, look at the National Institutes of Health consensus panel, they talked about the ratio of omega-6 essential fatty acid intake to omega-1, uh, omega-3 fatty acid intake being optimally one-to-one. -one. Few, if any, people that I've met in clinical practice are anywhere close to that presumed ideal of 1-6 to 1-3 omega intake. So here we have a circumstance where in fact that shift and overabundance of omega-6 versus omega-3 has been implicated by some nutritionists in the promotion of cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, the emergence of more inflammatory disorders in the body by shifting the pathways of eicosanoids or prostaglandins, the chemical messengers that turn on inflammation and affect many body functions such as blood pressure and all sorts of uh, intermediary metabolic activity. So, here we have a general overview. Now, omega-9 fatty acids have not really been looked at that carefully, but certainly found in the Mediterranean diet and certainly shown to have overall beneficial essential effects, and most notably anti-inflammatory actions. But out there we've got some supplements that, in my mind, are ridiculous. Um, why would anybody use a supplement that contains omega-6 and 3? unless that particular person had a very special problem. Uh, much of our understanding of what happens with o o omega essential fatty acid deficiencies comes from studies of people undergoing intravenous nutrition who were starved of essential fatty acids during their therapy. But the deficiency state of essential fatty acids globally is uh, quite uncommon except under extremes of nutritional circumstance. So, let's tell ourselves that really the jazz is in the omega-3 story, and we need to know a great deal more about the omega-3 story. Well, let me talk about some misconceptions that are out there. Omega-3 fatty acids may be formed from precursors that are found in vegetable sources, like walnut oil, healthy soybean oil, they contain omega-3 precursors. 
but the precursors need to be converted by certain delta desaturase enzymes in the body to the active omega-3 fatty acids, most notably EPA or icosa pentanoic acid and DHA or docosa hexanoic acid. So here we are, we have to get a little bit technical and talk about this cascade of essential fatty acid uh, activity in the body, where the real jazz is in EPA and DHA, and I describe EPA, with its E, as the emperor of fatty acids. Now in the conversion of fatty acids, EPA is readily convertible to DHA, but you can't convert DHA to EPA. That's why I call it the emperor. And in general terms, EPA, icosapentanoic acid, has anti-inflammatory effects that are not shared to the same degree by DHA. Now DHA is obviously the most abundant building block fatty acid or lipid substance in the central nervous system. So people when they mention DHA think about central nervous system function. But remember, you've got EPA readily convertible to DHA. So in my therapeutic preference, I always look for a preponderance of EPA or icosapentanoic acid in the fish oil preparation. And we're going to talk a little bit more about pharmaceutical formulations and delivery of omega-3 fatty acids because of their importance in therapeutics. And they have emerged in modern literature with just an incredible legion of potential benefits. Every single body system or system within the body benefits from omega-3 fatty acids. They're anti-inflammatory. They certainly have major benefits for cardiovascular health, including prevention of death from a sudden heart attack, reduction of blood cholesterol, most notably triglycerides, indirect antioxidant effects, and a whole host of other benefits such as even maintaining patency of coronary arteries following bypass surgery. Now, these observations are well published in the literature, but many conventional physicians, and quite shockingly, many cardiologists are not utilizing the cardiovascular benefits of fish oil. Let's look at the central nervous system and see that they have antidepressant effects and obviously proto-morphogenic effects by providing essential fatty acids to maintain cellular membrane activity in the central nervous system. It goes on, the gastrointestinal tract benefits from fish oil, not only from an anti-inflammatory perspective, but again from the recreation of membrane, membrane linings and even to some degree the correction of damage that may be induced by noxious drugs such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. There's a whole host of disease states that have been treated by omega-3 fatty acids including the effective treatment of Crohn's disease in terms of reducing relapse, management of rheumatoid arthritis, management of more simple types of arthritis, and the list goes on. Rheumatoid disease, you name it, there is in every inflammatory component of a disease some perceived benefit in general from the administration of active omega-3 fatty acids. Now let me stress active and tell you that vegetable sources of omega-3 fatty acids are not reliable sources of active omega-3 fatty acids. And in retail dietary supplement practice, this has been a, a major misrepresentation where people have been told, oh, take flaxseed oil for omega-3 supplementation. In some circumstances, only 2% of the omega precursor over a 24-hour period can be converted by the body into an active moiety or active component such as EPA or DHA. So this is an overview of essential fatty acids and we need to look at pharmaceutical formulations and how we use them and we're going to cover that, cover that in a subsequent module. Thank you for listening for this, to this module on essential fatty acids.